We are continuing today in a little mini series on prayer. Today's message is praying continually. We're going to be in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you have a Bible, you can go ahead and turn there. Bible app, you can swipe there. If you want to sync versions, I'm teaching out of the English Standard Version this morning. And uh, this is, uh, so since the beginning of the year, we've been thinking about healthy habits for the new year. And uh, I shared a few weeks ago on the healthy habit of prayer that is, how do you pray effectively? When you get news that a friend uh, and brother, his legs are no longer working the way they were a couple of days ago, how do you pray for him in a way that you get what you're asking for? And we looked at, in this healthy habit of prayer, not only what does the Bible say about prayer, but how do we pray Scripture. How do we pray the Bible? That's the idea on praying effectively. When we pray God's word back to him, his answer is yes. And so the first message from Ephesians 6, I showed you how we can ask God to empower my friend, Scott, whose legs stopped working. Lord, would you empower him with your strength? Would you equip him with your armor and may you embolden him with your gospel? That was right out of Ephesians chapter 6. And then last week we were looking at, okay, so when you get news that you weren't expecting and you are kind of blown out of the water and shocked, not in a good way, but in a hard way, how do you pray then? We looked at praying tearfully out of Psalm 22, and I showed you how you can cry out to God. Define your lament, lament defined, ask God to help, praise him anyway, and still I will trust in you. We looked at that acronym for CLAPS. Today what we're going to do is look at praying continually. That is when the Bible says to pray without ceasing, what's it talking about and how do we do that for one another particularly in this bumpy season of church life. It was a bumpy season for the church in Thessalonica. After Paul and Barnabas had their sharp disagreement and went their separate ways, Paul took Silas on a missionary journey, uh, and his second trip, second missionary journey, and stopped off in Thessalonica, a town of 200,000 people, city of 200,000 people, planted a church there. People started coming to know the Lord, and this is what would happen for Paul. Uh, big crowds would form, the power base there would get threatened, and they'd persecute him and throw him out of town, and he'd go plant a church in Berea, the next, church, the next town down the road. Well, he's, Paul's moved on. He's heard a good report about the church in Thessalonica. It seems like they're doing pretty well. But there's a couple of issues in the church related to laziness, related to sexual impurity that the leaders of the church need to address. And as the leaders start to address issues in the church that need to be addressed, it can get a little bit bumpy. And so right at the end of this letter, Paul gives some instruction to the church family to the church body in staccato fashion. It's been likened to uh, next fall, or, you know, in September, end of August, I'm going to take my daughter down to Arizona, drop her off in a college dorm, and my wife and I will probably, uh, she'll cry, I'll be tough, they're driving back home, right? <laughs> And the idea is when you're dropping them off at the dorm, you're taking 18 years of parental wisdom. Don't forget, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. Remember to, right? Brush your teeth, do your laundry, do all the stuff that we've been training you your whole life for. Staccato instruction. And so that's what Paul gets right at the end of this letter. Bam, 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 bam. So we're going to see that body life. How do we treat each other, especially when it's a little bit bumpy? But then what I'm going to be doing today and showing you is, how do you pray this? How do you pray 1 Thessalonians 5 for our leaders? How do we pray 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 for one another uh, in a way that God's going to answer? It. He's going to be moving us forward. So that's uh, setting the table for you. Let's go ahead and read through our passage, pray, and we'll go through it verse by verse. We are in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. 
Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. It's the word of the Lord for us this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks for your word. We're thankful for your presence here with us. And we ask, Father, in this season of life together, Lord, that you would bless. Father, we ask that you would help us to understand your word even now. May your Holy Spirit enlighten the eyes of our hearts so that we can receive it and believe it and live it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Samuel Chadwick said, the one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, or prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, mocks at our wisdom, but trembles when we pray. What is it to pray in such a way and to live in such a way that the devil himself trembles? How do we do this? How do we press in in prayer? And so let's consider to how we keep praying. This message, praying continually, it comes from verse 17, and it's there that we read, pray without ceasing. And we wonder about that as Christians. Does that mean that I'm just supposed to, like, get down onto my knees and just pray all day and not do anything? No, I don't think that's what it's talking about. It is you just keep praying. You don't quit. You don't give up. Kind of like David in Psalm chapter 40. I saw this, just been going through the Psalms and my personal devotions lately, and I uh, just saw this the other morning, where in Psalm 40, for those of you who lived through the 80s and you listened to you 2 that song's going to maybe ring in your ears right now. They put this to song. I like it. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. Note that David says, I waited patiently for the Lord. I think that's what it means to pray continually, to pray without ceasing. There he is waiting patiently for the Lord, and it say, he says that he inclined to me. He heard my cry. So as David is waiting patiently upon the Lord, he's crying out to the Lord, and God heard. Well, what was David's circumstance? Why was he waiting on the Lord? Why was he crying out to the Lord? He says, he drew me up from the pit of destruction. I was in this pit of destruction. I couldn't get myself out of this pit. I was about to be consumed and destroyed, and yet God answered. God drew me out of the pit of destruction. And he also says, out of the miry bog. There I was sinking down, my steps were slipping, my feet were sliding, and he drew me out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. Hey, maybe you can relate to David. This morning it feels like you are in a pit of destruction. Your feet, it's like you just can't quite get your footing. The ground beneath you is slippery, it's sliding, and you're sinking down and you're crying out to the Lord, and I'll tell you what, when destruction is coming at you quickly, that can be a really hard time to wait on the Lord. It looks like you're going to be destroyed any minute. And David is saying, I waited patiently on the Lord. I didn't take matters into my own hands. I didn't push abort. I didn't do all the stuff that maybe I could have done, but I just waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and he heard my cry. I think that's what it means to pray without ceasing. David's a good example of it for us here in Psalm 40. So we wanna pray without ceasing. Uh, let's keep praying for Table Rock Fellowship. 
Hey, God is doing a really a rare work of prayer at the fellowship. This last year, we saw the number of you sharing those weekly prayer requests, writing them down on your Connect card. Those just started growing and more and more and more. We were getting zero to five prayer requests for the last 24 years on any given weekend. Pretty standard, very typical. 95% of churches do not have an effective central prayer ministry. But then you guys started sending them in. We started praying. We started sending out to you praying for you cards as we as pastors and elders and staff would pray for you. And the requests just kept coming in. So that at one point, an elder wrote to me and he said, hey, Victor, I'm a little bit, I don't know what to do with an email that has 70 prayer requests in it when I'm running my business on Monday morning. What do I do with this? And I said, yeah, guys, there's some prayer momentum here. We're going to need to downshift and launch everybody every day. Kind of a preemptive strike. Hey, how can we pray for you every day this winter? And you guys sent in your prayer requests. You know, as a pastor, it's like pulling teeth. It's one of the hardest things to do in ministry is to get people to share their prayer requests. But last winter, 327 of you, I think it was, shared households, 327 households, shared your three winter prayer requests. And God raised up a prayer team of 77 individuals or couples to pray for you guys every day this winter. And the Lord's doing it again. Just this weekend, we're distributing our spring prayer binders. It's not 327 households, it's 396 households saying, pray for me. It's not just 77 intercessors, it's 85 intercessors. And then what do you do with the weekly requests? The Lord raises up, raised up a team now, I think it's 95 or 96 different people who are praying for you, anything you write on your Connect card, they're praying for you every week. I send it to them on Sunday afternoon. They're praying for you. This doesn't happen. God is doing a great work in prayer, and so it's no time to stop. Let's keep praying for Table Rock Fellowship. Hey, for those of you who are sharers, sharing your prayer requests, thank you, keep them coming. For those of you guys who are praying weekly or seasonally, thank you, we thank the Lord for you. Let's keep Praying, it is an amazing thing. As we think about praying continually, it's been said like this, a day hemmed in prayer is less likely to come unraveled. Have you noticed that too? Uh, you know, I've had Levi's and there's been styles and fashions where you just like tear the bottom off and it looks kind of cool. But you know what I find when I tear the hem off my Levi's? They just don't last as long. Those things, they just start ripping up the back. They start to come unraveled. Better to have that hem on there. When I hem my day in the morning, in the evening with prayer, it does seem to set me up for a better day, a less unraveled day. And I think so too for a church. A church hemmed in prayer is much less likely to come unraveled. And I'm so thankful for this season that we find ourselves in right now that we are becoming a praying church. Let's keep at it. Well, let's keep praying, not just for Table Rock Fellowship, but let's pray for our leaders specifically. We see this here in verse 12. Uh, notice what he says. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you, who are over you in the Lord, and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. It's interesting here, Paul doesn't refer to them specifically as elders or deacons. This is a new church plant and all of that is still really embryonic, but he does say you've got leaders who are over you in the Lord and he describes the kind of work that they're doing, uh, what it is that their job is. They labor among you, they're over you in the Lord, they admonish you. And so I think we at the fellowship, first of all, let's think about all the different leaders God has blessed us with. God has blessed us with elders. He's blessed us with deacons and deaconesses. We've got an amazing staff. We have ministry leads and life group leaders. And so as we think about praying for the leaders at Table Rock Fellowship, these are the kinds of people that we're praying for. Let's keep praying for table, TRF's leaders to be hardworking and accessible. I see this here in verse 12, hardworking. Uh, we ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you. The word labor means to labor to the point of exhaustion. When uh, I was coming on staff uh, a couple of years ago, Pastor Bill said to me, there's nobody who works harder at the fellowship than 
Esther Taylor. So true. We love Esther, our women's ministry director. Yeah. <laughs> Esther is poured out day after day after day. If you drive by the fellowship, there's going to be a white truck in the parking lot nine times out of ten. That's Esther's truck, and she is here discipling women, preparing Bible studies, putting on like amazing events and conferences and the whole thing. Esther is laboring among us, not just hardworking, but also available, accessible, that uh, out in the courtyard almost every weekend, she's there in a booth. You can go up and just talk to Esther, and that's how we want our leaders to be. Not working so hard, so busy, 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 that they're up in some ivory tower and you never can see them, can never get an appointment with them. Because, as Eugene Peterson says, busy pastor should ring in our ears like embezzling banker or adulterous wife. Woo! It's kind of a contradiction of terms. Embezzling banker. That's not the banker you want. A busy pastor. And the idea is, if you communicate to everybody, I'm busy, busy. Boy, am I busy. Boy, am I important. Boy, do I not have any time for you. I got to go, right? And that's, you're missing the point. I'm thankful for you guys who are, you know, courteous. You say, Pastor, I know you're really busy. But every time I hear that, I hear Eugene Peterson, busy pastor. Don't let him think that. And, uh, and more what I think of is uh, full, yes. But I want you to know, I, we as elders, we have pa as pastors, we're all about you. We're all about loving people. You want to get together for coffee? We are available. And uh, I think of my life not as busy, but as full. In the Old Testament, when they set aside priests for full-time vocational ministry, they consecrated them. And that word for consecration means to literally have your hands filled with the work of the Lord. So my hands are full right now of the work of the Lord, but we've got time for you, and I think that's really important. So be praying that TRF's leaders would be hardworking and accessible. Let's also pray that the leaders would provide fatherly leadership. Verse 12 continues, and are over you in the Lord. This idea of being over you in the Lord, it's kind of like a dad in a household or a father in a household. We as fathers, uh, there's a, a certain way that we are over our family. We set the direction in a certain sense for our family. We provide protection for our family. And if one of our kids or our wife is in a hard place, they're suffering, we care for the well-being of our family. As I think about the leaders here at the fellowship who provide fatherly leadership for us, who are over us in the Lord, I think of Mike Sweeney. Do you guys know Mike Sweeney? He is an amazing brother in Christ. You can applaud for Mike, okay? He's not here, you won't embarrass him. Okay. That Mike Sweeney and I, just this last week, we sat down to work on the agenda for our elders meeting this next Tuesday. There's a certain direction setting. He serves as our moderator. That doesn't mean that he's the, the chairman of the board. It means that he's one among equals. Elders can contribute ideas, what we need to be looking at for our agenda. So we're working on this together, setting some direction. But he also provides protection for our family. He, is, uh, he was the chief of police here in Central Point, and he retired from that. When it comes to protection, Mike actually oversees the safety team at the fellowship. Uh, you don't know that they're there, but you, you can't see them, but you know that they're there, okay? We're super thankful for the safety team because it's a crazy world out there that makes sure that this is a safe place for us to worship. So in a very real sense, he provides for our protection. But our leaders also protect us by teaching us the Word of God so that we're protected from falsehood and false doctrine that can just wreck people's lives. And Mike also provides for the care and the well-being of the fellowship. I have seen him meeting many times with people who are in hard spots, going through difficult times. He leads a life group. Uh, he visit, like I've seen him meet for long like seasons with a brother who had a mental illness and he was just available for him all the time. So I think that's what fatherly leadership is, direction, protection, and care over you in the Lord. And let's keep praying for TRF's leaders to be courageous counselors. That's that word, and admonish you. So think about courageous counselors. There's a, um, Pastor Bill Muir. Have you guys heard of Bill Muir before? Do you know Pastor Bill? 
And he's shared with me many, many times. He's moved from this pulpit to the red pulpit. There's those red chairs out in the courtyard, okay? He says, I love my red pulpit. I said, Bill, are you available to speak? I, no time soon, I'm in the red pulpit, you know. And uh, God bless him. What he loves about the red pulpit, and this is what he tells me, admonish. That is meeting with people one-on-one -on -one individually to provide uh, some correction doctrinally or morally. That's what admonish is. And he says, I love meeting with people one-on-one -on -one because I can hear their thought processes. I can challenge their thinking. Have you ever had Bill ask you some questions, right? Kind of tinkering. Does a great job admonishing us, leading us and helping us. And he's a great example of that. So may a TRF's leaders be God's kind of leaders who are hardworking and accessible, providing fatherly leadership and offering courageous counsel. It's courageous because it takes a little bit of courage to speak words of correction to people, but we need it. As we think about praying continually, Thomas Watson puts it this way, prayer delights God's ear, it melts his heart, it opens his hand. God cannot deny a praying soul. So we pray continually to delight God's ear. He likes the sound of your voice. You're not wearing him out. He's not tired of it. It actually delights his ear. It touches his heart. It opens his hand. Chuck Swindoll said he'd play a game with his kids when they were real little. He had a hand fistful of pennies, and their job was to pry back the fingers to get into those pennies and they would be delighted to get the pennies. And he said, I was just delighted to play the game with my kids, you know. So let's keep praying, not only for TRF's leaders, but also TRF's members, verses 13 to 15. And you say to yourself, well, we don't really have membership here at the fellowship, and I'll grant you that. We don't have membership like your Costco membership. You pay for it, you get a card, and you can get into the place. We don't have membership like the Rogue Valley Country Club, where you sign up and pay a bunch of money, and you can go and be their member. Our membership is different. We have members of the TRF family. There is a body of Christ and there are members of the body. And so it's, it is a membership that's spiritual, very real. It's a one another sort of a thing. Those who call Table Rock Fellowship home and let's pray for each other to be respectful in verse 13 and to esteem them, those leaders, be respectful towards them and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. So the leaders are doing this work of gospel ministry. We want to esteem them very highly in love. And as I shared with you last week, hear it again. The church in Antioch was to esteem very highly in love Paul. They were also to esteem very highly in love Barnabas, even after their sharp disagreement, because they're all just still continuing to do gospel ministry. And so we want to esteem our leaders very highly in love. We're going to be respectful to them. And I am so thankful for the way that I have felt this from you since I came on to the pastoral team here uh, January 1st, 2022, that you have uh, honored me. I felt honored by you. When I approach you at your table at the cafe, you welcome me. When I teach the Bible here from the platform, you're receptive, you're listening, you're hearing, you want to hear from the Lord. Uh, when I've introduced different prayer initiatives, you've engaged them. I felt highly honored by you, and I thank the Lord for you. I pray that that would always be the case for all all the leaders here at the fellowship. It was so cool. The very first weekend I spoke here uh, and I came on staff, um, my daughters said to me as I was going out, to, taking them out to the car, they're like, Dad, this is so cool. You've got a bodyguard. I said, I know, kids. What's the deal here? Hey, watched out for, protected. And uh, you never know when the paparazzi is going to show up. You know, you got to watch out for them. <laughs> So let's keep praying for TRF's members to be respectful and peaceful. Verse 13 continues, be at peace among yourselves, especially when things are a little bit bumpy. 
You know, it's as though uh, each of us has two buckets. In one we have water and in the other we have gas. And as we're doing life together, we're rubbing shoulders together, we're serving together. There's gonna be a little friction from time to time. Where there's friction, there's gonna be smoke. Where there's smoke, there's gonna be fire. And it's right there and then that you need to be really wise about which bucket you're gonna use. Hey, am I gonna, this could be kind of fun. We'll just dump a bunch of gas onto this conversation right now and boom, everything blows up. Well, that was fun, that wasn't dull. Don't do that, please, don't do that. Go with the water, pour out that fire. Be at peace among yourselves. It is, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. Jesus came as the Prince of Peace to make peace with us and reconcile us to himself. So be at peace among yourselves, be peaceful. And also, let's keep praying for TRF's members to be helpful, verse 14. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. There were people in uh, Thessalonica, the church there, who heard that Jesus is coming back soon. And they thought, this is great news. I'm kind of sick and tired of this dead end job. I think I'll quit and just wait for Jesus to come back. So they did. They quit their jobs and they just started sitting around and they said, you know, there's a benevolence ministry at the church. Let's just mooch off of that for a while. This is great. Well, people are looking around. They're saying, uh, they're not really working. It seems like we're feeding them. What's the deal? Hey, what, are they, what do they need to do? Admonish the idol. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians, he who does not work with his own hands shall not eat. I know of a dad who applied that to his family. <laughs> he, his thing was, hey kids, if you don't do your chores, you're not gonna have dinner tonight. And uh, I think the kids called CPS and that didn't work out so good for him. I wouldn't encourage it. But hey, he does not work. Admonish the idle, encourage the faint hearted. There are some faint hearted people who just wanna throw in the towel and give up and quit walking with the Lord. Hey, they need, they're so discouraged. Come alongside them, encourage the faint hearted. There are other people in the fellowship who are weak from physical sickness or physical suffering. They're weak from uh, spiritual stuff of maybe the sin in their own life has just weakened them so much. They're repenting, but they're struggling. Maybe they're weak because of a legalistic background that they grew up in and help the weak, be helpful to them and be patient with them all. Hey, let's be, help one another because guess what? Uh, people, have you noticed, they're going to take some patience. People are people. It's been said this way, God has an unlimited supply of people you can't stand and problems you can't handle, and he just keeps sending them and sending them into your life. Hey, let's be patient with all, especially when things are a little bumpy, especially when things are a little bit stressful. Hey, let's be patient with each other. And let's keep praying for your TRF's members to be merciful. Verse 15, see that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. That is that we're not fighting fire with fire. Hey, they just did something evil to me, so I'm going to do something evil back to them. No, this is a turn the other cheek sort of thing. This is a not retaliating sort of a thing, but you're not repaying anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good. I love those Salvation Army trucks that say doing the most good on the side of them. I think that's great. Hey, let's be Christians who do the most good to one another and to everyone. And I think this is the kind of community that everyone wants to belong to. This is the kind of church that everyone wants to belong to, one where people are respectful and peaceful and helpful and merciful. Don't you want to belong to that kind of a church? I do. It sounds a whole lot like a Jesus kind of church. Jesus, who is always respectful and helpful and merciful, and peaceful, so awesome. So let's be that kind of a church and let's pray, be praying for TRF's members to be that way. Praying continually, Charles Finney put it this way, prayer bathes the soul in an atmosphere of the divine presence. 
Why wouldn't we pray continually when we can get this kind of a bath for our soul with an atmosphere of the divine presence? We sang that sweet hour of prayer, and I think you can relate. I can relate. It's been a crazy day. It's been a crazy week. It's been a crazy month. It's been a crazy life, but we can come to that hour of prayer or those five minutes of prayer or however long that prayer window is, and it's then sometimes that the Lord visits us with his presence. He bathes us with an atmosphere of the divine. Let's keep praying not only for TRF's leaders and members, but also our Christ-likeness. Verse 16, that we would be joyful and thankful. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Rejoice always. What's this mean? Does that mean that I've just got to put on a smiling face and just happy clappy all day long? No, I think it means that even when the circumstances get really, really difficult. In the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. There's an abiding joy underneath it all where I can remind myself. So sometimes my joy bucket is not full. Sometimes my joy bucket, it leaks and it feels a little empty sometimes, especially when things are tough. But I have found that when I remind myself of this truth, the Lord Jesus Christ died for my sins and rose again. It helps my joy bucket fill right back up. I think about how I've been forgiven of all my sins. I think about how the holy, holy, holy God has given me a favorable verdict. He hasn't cast me to hell. He's actually preparing a place for me there in heaven. And he says, let not your hearts be troubled. And it's there that I can rejoice always, even when it's a sorrowful time. And I think it's like Jesus. Though he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, he was also rejoicing. He, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Uh, prayer marked every significant moment in Jesus' life. The crowds would gather and he'd go out and pray by himself in the middle of the night. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. <laughs> Not an easy one, right? But an important one. I've been practicing this since last Thanksgiving when I shared that message, Unending Thanksgiving, with you. And it's changing my life, you guys. That no matter what happens, just give <coughs> thanks for it. And here's why. God, you're in control of it. You actually know what you're doing. I didn't want to stub my toe on the end of the bed right now, but Lord, you know what you're doing. Thank you that I've got a bed, you know. Or a toe. And yeah, thank you, Lord, for my toe. I think I've still got a toe, right? It's throbbing. I must, it must still be there. And in this, because what we know about all circumstances, God is a potter. We are the clay. He's molding us and shaping us and having his own way. He's conforming us into the image of Jesus Christ through all these circumstances. And really what he's doing is he's making us, he's giving us a greater capacity to enjoy him forever and ever. I think that's pretty good. He's making us so that we can bring more glory to him forever and ever. And so we say, Lord, it's not how I would have written the ticket today. But Lord, thank you that you know what you're doing. Give thanks in all circumstances. So let's keep praying for TRF's Christ likeness, that we'd be spiritual. Do not quench the spirit. Jesus never did. Even when the Holy Spirit led Jesus and drove Jesus out into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, he didn't say no to the Holy Spirit. He followed. He was obviously deeply spiritual. Quench the Spirit, what's this? It's like a man who's on an airplane ride and he sits down in business class and the person sitting next to him, uh, it seems like he's not a believer. The, the guy is a Christian and he senses that the Lord would have him share his faith with this person and sit next to him. That he'd have the Lord would have him share the gospel. 
But the businessman quenches the spirit when he says, no, I'm not going to do it. Guilty. How many of us have been there, done that? He says, no, don't quench the spirit. And then the Bible also says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. As this businessman, a Christian businessman, is flying on the flight, the person sitting next to him starts sharing some off-color jokes, and the Christian decides, hey, I'm going to enter right in. Starts telling a few off-color jokes himself, and now he's moved from quenching the Holy Spirit to grieving the Holy Spirit. Quench the Spirit. It's like there's a fire that you're quenching, you're dousing out. Don't do that. And so let's pray that we would be spiritual uh, Christians, that there would be a spiritual Christ-likeness about TRF. And let's keep praying for TRF's Christ-likeness that we'd be biblical, verses 20 and 21. Do not despise prophecies, the prophetic word, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. This is Paul's second letter. He wrote Galatians, and now he's writing 1 Thessalonians. The canon isn't complete. There would be prophets who would come, and they'd prophesy. He says, hey, don't despise the prophetic word. And in order to test everything, we need to be people of the book. It's going to give us discernment and wisdom to recognize what's true and false, what's good, what's evil, and hold fast to what is good. And then that we'd be watchful, verse 22, abstain from every form of evil. There are many faces of evil, and Jesus abstained from every one of them, and we need to be that kind of a church too. So let's keep praying for TRF's Christ-likeness, that we'd be joyful, thankful, spiritual, biblical, and watchful. And so this is how we can pray 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 for our leaders, for our members, for our entire church, in a way that God says yes to. God wants our leaders to be hardworking, like Esther Taylor. God wants our leaders to be accessible, and you get the idea. So this is God's will, it's his word. And so we can pray this back to him, his answer will be yes, it's effective, it's timely because this church, that church was in a bumpy season, our church has been in a bumpy season, and, uh, Another idea here about praying continually. So here's how we pray. Prayer is the key to the morning and the bolt to the evening. Really good to unlock the door in the morning with the key of prayer and to bolt the door in the evening uh, by praying at night. Well, as we put a bolt on this sermon at last, there were five men entrapped in a deserted zinc mine in Salem, Kentucky. My wife and I did ministry in Salem, in Kentucky, uh, Harlan, Kentucky, Harlan County. And, uh, and so this resonates with me. They were entrapped in a deserted zinc mine in Salem, Kentucky by falling rocks. They had nothing to eat, and it was pitch black. If you've been to the Oregon caves, you know. Utter darkness. One of the men could have saved himself, but he went back to warn the others, and he got trapped inside. The entombed men realized they could not escape. It was as though they were in a pit of destruction. They're in the Oregon Caves. It, there is a miry floor in those caves. You can slip. It's wet. And they're trapped. They can't get out. So what do they do? They began to pray and sing. Their prayer and praise service lasted 53 hours. Then they were rescued. Later, one man testified, we lay there from Friday morning till Sunday morning. We prayed without ceasing. When the rescuers reached us, we were still praying. When the men brought up out of the mine, were brought up out of the mine, on the caps of each one were scrawled these words, if we are dead when you find us, we are all saved. How about that? They prayed continually. They prayed without ceasing. They prayed from Friday to Sunday, three days and three nights. And it reminds me that Easter's coming. There is a resurrection morning coming. It's at the end of March. It's March 31st this year, and so we're going next week to begin our Easter series, five weeks on joy in the morning. Last week I shared with you praying tearfully. And there is some of that. Psalm 30 says, uh, weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. 
There is a resurrection morning at the end of the month. And so for the month of March, this will be our sermon series, TRF Easter Series 2024, Joy in the Morning. My wife was asking me, what do you think we should go in terms of sermon series? This phrase came to mind and she said, oh yeah, doesn't Torin Wells have a song about that right now? And I said, you know, I think he does. Here's some of these lyrics. It's really timely for us. Everything happens for a reason, but you don't know what you don't know. And you'll never have peace if you don't let go of tomorrow. Because it ain't even faith till your plan falls apart, but you still choose to follow. If it doesn't make sense right now, it will when it's over. There will be joy in the morning. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for the reality that weeping does last for a night. We don't want to deny that or ignore that. We want to shed tears appropriately and well. And yet, Father, we're thankful for the promise and the hope that joy does come in the morning. And so, Father, we ask for your blessing upon the fellowship. God, may, uh, may our leaders and members and, and just this church have a sense of Christ-likeness. We ask your blessing upon them all. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to partake of communion now. Pastor Bobby Bob will be up to lead us in it. The tables are open. Grab two cups and hold on to them, please. Jesus, uh, on the night that he would be betrayed, had that last supper with his disciples. And you can read about all of the things that he said and imparted to them, a lot of heavy things, a lot of uh, impactful things, things that would change their lives. And he would warn them of things to come. He says, be prepared and know this is going to happen. And during that meal, when he's there with uh, his 12 disciples, actually one had left, Judas, he does something remarkable. And it's what we get to do today. It has lasted centuries. He says, I want you to do this. And as often as you do this, remember me. We hold in our hands something very simple. And yet it is profound when you think about it. We're to chew on it, we're to ponder it, we're to contemplate it as well. So during this meal, Jesus pauses. He takes some bread and he tears it, gives it to his disciples, and this is what he says. He says, this is my body, take and eat. Take and eat. This is my body. So let's pray as we do that. And Lord, it was your body that would receive the, the scourging, the punishment, the wounding, the piercing. You would endure pain and suffering. Lord, you would feel loneliness, abandonment as you hung on the cross. But you did it because you knew that by doing so, not only would you fulfill prophecy, but you would make a way for us to come to know you and to have fellowship. And so thank you, Jesus, that you took this wrath the wrath that was due us, that we deserve, and you took it upon yourself. And so, Lord, by thinking about this and contemplating it, we want to give you thanks. We want to give your body, what happened to you, worth. And so, Lord, we take this simple bread, knowing that it is by your wounds that our very souls are healed. 
And so for those of us that know you, you have put our souls back together. You have made us whole in you. And you have given us life, not sparingly, but abundant. So may we celebrate that today and honor you by taking this simple cracker in faith, remembering and cherishing what you did. Let's take the cracker. Afterwards, it says that he then took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's pray. Lord, it is you, Father, that allowed your Son to endure the pain, the suffering, being despised, being mocked. But then it was you, Father, that allowed your Son to have his blood spilled. You watched, you observed, and you knew that unless he did that, we could not have a relationship with you and that our sins could not be forgiven. And we thank you, Jesus, for your precious blood that is perfect, that the simplest of drop is enough to forgive all of our sins, to wash us as white as snow. Let's take a few moments Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart that if there is anything that you are holding on to with sin, maybe you feel the weight, the shame, the guilt of it, now is the time to quietly confess that to Him, to give it to Him, and to know that this cup that we hold in our hands is a symbol of that perfect, lasting forgiveness in our lives for all of our sins. So take a moment. So Jesus, we thank you this, that this cup is a reminder of how forgiven we are. We celebrate it, we drink it in faith, and we give it thanks and worth. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's take the cup. Good things to be reminded of, yes? So if you would like uh, to talk to an elder or a pastor, we'll be up here at the front. Uh, Victor is going to come up in just a second, give a benediction. And then if you would like to pray with some folks, we have some folks that will assemble uh, in the prayer corner in just a second. Then if you would like to be baptized and join the five guys that were baptized yesterday at our event, the baptismal has been warmed up and it's ready for you. So if you've not been baptized, that is a glorious day to be baptized because Jesus said to do that, to be baptized. There's something special and powerful about the waters of baptism. I would invite you to take advantage of a nice warm baptismal on a bright sunny day, a day that you will not forget. And then if you're hungry and Victor has tired you out and he's just like worn you out and you need to be refueled, we have a cafe with some free food right over there. Enjoy that as well. So Victor. Our benediction today picks up where we left off in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body 
be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you guys.